Wow, Modern Trek's penultimate season episodes do tend to have a lot of goodbyes, don't they? Hello Interwebs and welcome to my review of Star Trek Picard Season 1 Episode 9 at in Arcadia Ego. I hope I said that right. The first part of the season finale of Star Trek Picard. As always, I'm going to give my spoiler-free thoughts up front before diving into my spoiler discussion breakdown scene by scene of the episode. And I have to say, so for my spoiler-free thoughts... What a powerful, powerful episode. Like I said, while I do think that this episode is a lot of goodbyes and setting up for the season finale, much in the same way that Star Trek Discovery Season 2's Part 1 of their Part 2 season finale was a lot of setup, this one works a lot better than Star Trek Discovery Season 1, Season 2, Part 1 finale, in that... While this is a lot of setup, it does give us a really meaty setup that really dives into, like ethical questions and really makes me think about like what is the right answer in this situation or what's the right thing to do and that's really really strong with all these pieces coming together throughout all the season to finally get me into the situation of like oh this is an intriguing and really hard ethical dilemma right here but one that I know what the clear answer is in terms of um, my moral values that Picard is sort of showing here and again I'm trying to remain as spoiler free as possible but uh, it really just draws on all these threads to really make me think like, oh, this is a really hard ethical dilemma that while I understand the moral way to go, it may not be the most practical or prudent way to go. And, and there's no inherently practically right answer here. And it, it just it, it's such a beautifully done ethical dilemma, much better than and as much as I like the Star Trek Discovery season two finale, that was a lot of like piece placing of like getting pieces on the board whereas this one's really trying to tie together all the ethical and philosophical discussions and really place our characters in the emotional places that they need to be in going into the finale instead of just like setting us up on the chessboard so we have all the pieces ready uh to go into a big battle in the next episode which clearly there will be a big battle but honestly we didn't really need much setup there it's really just all these emotional pieces and it really makes this episode work beautifully. As always, in every episode of Picard, there are some really beautifully written character scenes in here. Every character in this episode has some moments to shine and there's some really beautiful, again without spoilers, surprise uh, guests and cameos and, and uh, developments of the lore behind this series in this episode that I think just really just deepens and enriches everything. While I did have a lot of problems with last episode's um, info dump, episode 8's info dump of like sort of a lot of the stuff that's been going on this season and sort of explaining stuff, it, this episode really utilizes the, all that information to grand uh, execution and, and really just sets up the pieces in such a really beautiful, exquisite way. If I have any knock against this episode, it's the same knock that I've had against Star Trek Picard season one in general, and it's just the wasted opportunity of the Borg Cube storyline. Again, I don't want to talk about it too much in my spoiler-free section, but again, in this episode, it just feels like the Borg Cube has so much story potential that ultimately just gets not used in any way, shape, or form. And it just continually be continually becomes the biggest disappointment. Not because what happens on the board cube isn't interesting. In fact, everything that happens on the board cube is very interesting for the most part. It just doesn't ever get effectively used as well as it could. And that trend sadly continues into this episode, which is a bit unfortunate um, in my opinion. So I think that's really the only knock against that, this episode that I have. But in terms of everything else, there's some really fun set pieces, but uh, and really fun action, but some more importantly, some really great character moments and some really great philosophy and ethical dilemmas being set up to kind of come to fruition in the final episode of this season. And I am so excited for it. So that's my spoiler-free review of Star Trek Picard. So if you haven't seen the episode yet, pause it here and jump back in as soon as you've watched the episode. Now, before we get into the spoiler-filled section, just a couple of housekeeping items. First things first, don't forget to subscribe to this channel and also hit the bell so you don't miss any of my reviews, or Star Trek discussions, or big featured videos on this channel. It would really mean the world to me. Also, speaking of featured videos, something that I am really, really excited about and I just want to kind of promote here tomorrow, which will be Friday at 5 a.m., my next featured video will be going up, and it's honestly one of the videos that I am most proud of, of of making in the past few months. 
It is a video on Half-Life 2, one of my favorite video games ever made, and a discussion of how Half-Life 2 discusses the nature of violence and specifically systemic violence and how it uses the video game medium in a unique way to discuss that. It's a very uh, Trek type of topic, but told through one of my favorite video games of all time. And I actually filmed some of the video on location in New Mexico, which is where the original Half-Life took place. So it's honestly something I think is a step up in terms of my production. It's by no means uh, the best that I can do and I still want to evolve and grow, but I'm I'm honestly just very proud of the video. So if, uh, if you're watching this on Friday, Please, uh, please, please, please check out that video. If you're watching this before then, just make sure to come back to this channel tomorrow and give that video a watch. It would, it would truly, truly, truly mean the world to me. All right, enough hawking my wares. You didn't come to this video to listen to me hawk my wares. You wanted to talk about Star Trek Picard's penultimate episode, and let's get going and breaking it down scene by scene. All right, the episode opens up with the La Serena. I keep saying the La Serena. The episode opens up with La Serena going through the transwarp condo with me, get Jurati kind of freaking out, which, you know, fits her character. And I just liked how as we're going through the transwarp condo, we get shots of every single character uh, reacting to their anticipation of coming up to this planet. And specifically, I'll call out uh, Soji just having this, like, smile on her face and Raffi and Picard having a bit more apprehension. It was just really small character moments that let the actors shine, and I thought it was really brilliantly done there. Then we arrive at the planet, and Raffi compliments Soji again. Raffi, and I'll say this right now just because it'll keep coming up throughout the episode, Raffi has so many funny one-liners throughout this episode. I think there's this one, uh, there's the line later on when they learn about all the Romulan warbirds showing up, where they say, like, well, it's only the first 109 that you really have to worry about. And then when she has the line of, like, uh, with Picard, she's like, nah, I wasn't going to tell you. It's fine. Uh, just Raffi, uh, Michelle Hurd just has this really dry sense of humor that resonates with me. It's very much my sense of humor. So I I, uh, I very much appreciate it every time she had the, those jokes. Then as they arrive at Corpalius, which, by the way, I didn't look up what that phrase means in Latin, but the title of the episode, by the way, I'll mention here, the title of the episode, for those of you who don't know, it basically is in Utopia There Is Death which I think just wonderfully encapsulates some of the ph philosophical themes of this episode, but we'll get to that in just a second. Uh, but I didn't look up what Corpalius was. I mean, knowing that, knowing the writer's tendency to use Latin in this, uh, in this season to really kind of uh, bring home some interesting... Uh, uh, philosophical ideas like sort of highlight things like Nepenthe was a drug that was used in Greek mythology to like cure all your ails. I'm sure it has something to do with that. So I'm kind of sad. Let me know in the comments uh, what the title of the planet means. Anyways, La Serena gets into a battle with Narek ship and it was a very, very cool BFX heavy dogfight. I really loved the sound effects. I really loved the like sort of them jumping behind each other. And I, I loved that actually the battle and moments in battle were used to have, again, a philosophical discussion here where when Narek tricked them into thinking that his ship was going down but using his cloak, which is a cool trick, by the way, it allowed Soji to ask this question of, like, should we save him or just let him die? And Picard says, like, no, there's a difference. You hold the knife. You uh, you have a duty to save this person's life, even if uh, even if he's done you harm, which I think is a wonderful microcosm of the greater philosophy and ethics that get brought up later in the episode. So it was just a really beautiful uh, hint at the ethical dilemma that Soji is going to be struggling with this entire episode to just have it be brought up in such a small scale way right up at the top of the episode is just showing showing the writers really understanding what themes that they want to discuss and just really just hammering it home. Then we get the power moves of power moves and a Borg cube, the Borg cube, the artifact just plows through and uh, saves the day. But then of course the Borg cube and the La Serena get brought down by these orchid flower things that the planet has, which I loved the orchid designs and I like this idea of them like kind of like gobbling things up and bringing them down and it being this like organic design again, fitting the like flower theme, the flower power power theme of these uh these synths who actually are like hippies on the planet so like the flower power theme is very real it does take down the board cube it does take down la serena uh, i did th find it a little bit weird that the board cube could be taken down so easily i mean we've always known the board cube to be these massive powerful things so it kind of getting taken down by flower stuff that this is on this like very undefended planet Felt a little bit weak to me, but I can I can get by it by saying that the Borg Cube was probably not at full power. But it is a bit uh, unfortunate that the Borg Cube just gets taken down here. I'll have more to discuss on the Borg Cube in a second uh, and my kind of disappointment with that storyline here. 
But the crew goes down, and Picard kind of goes into a uh, goes into a trance, goes into a, like a minor coma, knockout, whatever thing, and we go to our title screen. One of the things I was frustrated by is the opening title sequence uh, spoils that Brent Spiner is going to be in the episode. Which, to be fair, I didn't spoil who he was going to be playing, which I thought was nice. But I'm just a little frustrated by these these episode titles spoiling like Jerry Ryan being in an episode and Brent Spiner being in an episode. It's kind of annoying, and I know it's probably a legal thing that they kind of have to be in the title sequence just for how much money they're getting or something like that. But it is a bit frustrating that they kind of get spoiled up front. Then we wake up on La Serena's sick bay with Picard kind of having flashbacks of Earth, and we get a nice, nice little Easter egg with uh, Gerardi scanning him with an old, the original series uh, tricorder, which I thought was a cute little callback. And uh, it's a wonderfully played scene where we get Gerardi saying, you know, I think something's wrong with you, and Picard saying, you know, well, what is it? And we, we already know, and he already knows, but Gerardi thinks she's telling him he's going to die. And it's just, it's a, I, I think it's a really just a strong moment that the director, Akiva Goldsman, in this episode just played it silently for a minute. Like, it holds on Picard and Gerardi just looking at each other for a good, like, 15 to 30 seconds. And it, you just kind of read the emotion going between those two actors. It was a very well played and, and very confident to have just a few moments of just actors staring at each other. And you feeling the weight of that. It, just a great, uh, great directing choice by Akiva in in in, uh, in that scene. Then Picard comes out and talks to the La Serena crew, and I I adored his way of telling them that he has uh you know he has a terminal illness in the scene. He just basically says like this is what it is. And if anyone treats me like a dying old man, you're going to be pissing me off. It was just such a Picard way to deliver that, just so nonchalant and like here's the facts. Don't treat me differently. We're gonna move forward. And uh, it it was just very uh sad but also funny which just again shows the power of all these actors that they can play both the tones of like a kind of a humorous moment but also a very serious and sad moment as well just uh again excellently done also i thought it weird as they were like discussing the like logistics of the situation and whether they should go to synth town or whether they should go to the uh whether what was going on with everything that they didn't bring up the board cube like no one asked like oh yeah there was a board cube that was there we're not going to worry about that. Also, everyone kind of seems unconcerned about the artifact throughout the entire episode. Like, when they get to the artifact later on, they kind of just walk in. I know they know that a lot of people uh, were their friends on that ship, but last they knew, there were a lot of Romulans on that ship. And also, they just are powered up and blowing things up, which tells me, like, oh, activated Borg cube. I don't know who's on that ship. Maybe it's actually, like, legitimately Borg. And they just kind of like, well, yeah, we'll be fine. We'll just walk into the artifact and it's cool. Like, I felt like the, the lack of their knowledge about the Borg Cube was, a, uh, and their, like, lack of concern about the Borg Cube without, like, having any awareness of it. It's weird that they don't spend any time thinking about that. I understand why the writers didn't, because it's like, okay, we, it would be, like, forced drama when we know that everything's fine. So to have the characters be worrying about it, just be, like, wasted time in the story. But it is a bit weird that the characters have zero concern whatsoever. Also, we get a, we also get, like, Homicidal Fungus and a Gorn call-out from Raffi in that scene, which I think was funny. Then they go out and basically decide to all go to the artifact together. And I like Picard's line. He has said something about uh, hope and the odds make poor bedfellows. I think I thought that was a really beautiful line. All right, and then we get to the board cube. I'm gonna talk a lot about the board cube. And I think a lot of the stuff I'm gonna say right here uh, is actually gonna be more my problem with it in my review of the season as a whole. But basically they arrive at the board cube, they meet seven of nine and there's some really really nice scenes in here one in particular when picard gets in there someone uh an xb calls him lacutus and he kind of like is fearful and then he gets called picard and elnor comes up and hugs him and again just a beautiful moment between picard and elnor as they reunite and then we get like a moment between seven and picard where seven basically talks about how you know she saw them that's why she knew to show up there um, and, and again, and this is just going to go into what I'm going to talk about in a second, and I'll, I guess I'll start talking about it here. Uh, Seven of Nine just, like, having no residual trauma from being the Borg Queen. It was just sort of a way to get her to be aware of the situation and show up. But then also the Borg Cube's kind of taken out of the action anyways. It's just sort of sidelined with the XBs here. And possibly the Borg Cube may play a role in the big battle to come out. I'd be disappointed if it didn't have a role in the next episode. I'm sure it will in some way, shape, or form, but... Honestly, I like like I was saying in my spoiler-free section, I'm just frustrated that 
There's so many good ideas going on with the Borg cube. Hugh, the XBs, and like the talking about the victimhood of the Borg in general, and Seven of Nine becoming a Borg queen, and Elnor and Seven kind of developing a relationship. It's like all this really intriguing uh, themes and plot lines on the Borg cube that ultimately just feel like they haven't meant anything in the long run of things. Like ultimately the Borg cube didn't in and of itself didn't really tie much into the synth plot other than it was just like the place that soji happened to be at the top of the episode and yeah there was some plot stuff that happened there and there were some things like with ramda and the like her getting assimilated by the borg to to like destroy them but like ultimately it doesn't really tie into the main plot all that well which I guess it is fine. You don't need every piece of your story to like all fit neatly together, but it just feels like with the Borg cube being such a big deal to just have it not have any weight here and just like Seven not struggling with having been a Borg queen in any way. It all just kind of happened in that one episode. I was really hoping that there'd be some residual like effects of that in some way, shape or form, but really there's not. And the most of the Borg get killed. So I'm just ultimately... And like I said, this is probably more for when I do my season overview review of this, but I'm just kind of disappointed in in the Borg Cube storyline in general. Because Not because it's bad, but because it was, was good and there's so much potential there and so many great ideas by the writers, and it ultimately just kind of doesn't really get fully utilized to its fullest potential, which is just kind of disappointing. I mean, and that's really where the frustration is. It's not that it's a bad storyline, it's just a incomplete storyline. I know Michael Chabon has talked about how they had to kill a lot of their darlings, and that is something that happens during the writing phase of a show or anything like that, where you, you do have plot lines that you don't have time to fully develop, but this was a big one, and it just kind of frustrates me that it didn't really get as fleshed out as it could have. Again, I'll talk more about that in my season-long review, so I don't want to harp on it too much here, but it just, I, I really felt it in, in these scenes, because we get to the next scene, they learn that there's a lot of Romulan warbirds coming up on them, and then Elnor and Picard have a goodbye, and Picard has this wonderful line with Seven's like, oh, you know, it's up to you now to save the galaxy, which I, I really liked as sort of that passing of the torch to her, but again, because we haven't spent much time with you know, the Borg Cube. And also, we haven't spent much time with Elnor and Picard being together. Like, they didn't have much to do together on La Serena after we picked up Elnor. That, you know, these scenes, while they're really beautifully done, they ring a little bit hollow just because we haven't had as much time with them as I wish we had. So, again, I, I don't want to harp on this too much because this is really my only negative of the episode, so I'm going to move on. But, again, I think that whole sequence, even with Elnor, uh, while well, Elnor is wonderful, and again, I love him as a character, and I love every every plot beat we get with him, it ultimately doesn't ring as strong as it could have because we didn't get him as developed as we could have, and hopefully that'll be something that's rectified either in the finale, uh, probably not, but or in future seasons. Um, okay, so I'm going to stop there. That's my only negatives. I promise you that's the only negatives I really have on this episode. All right, then we get to Synth Town, and it's, like I said, a hippie commune. I think we got our first breasts in Star Trek. No, we got breasts in Star Trek Discovery Season 1. So, But we do get some on-display synthetic breasts here, which I thought was funny. I don't really care. I think we need to see more breasts in TV naturally, and also we should see more male nudity as well, but that's a different point. But I loved this, this whole sequence with going into the Synth Town and sort of seeing all these synths and Soji sort of reconnecting with her people again. And I just love how, and this is a repeated theme throughout the episode, that the synths are just enamored with organic life. They always like ask questions like, oh, you're upset. Oh, you're happy. And like when she, Arcadia, like goes up and touches Picard, she like sort of reads into the lines on his face. They like, they mean so much more, you know, grief and, 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 you know, pride and, and entrepreneurship. It's just, I, I like the synthetic sort of curiosity about organics. It's it's a really nice sort of traits to give them. And again, their costumes and the look of this is very much in Star Trek The Next Generation tradition of like kind of like long flowy costumes for all these like on-planet settlers. So it's kind of a kind of a nice call back in a weird way there. Then we get the surprise cameo, or less surprising because he was in the title sequence, but we get Brent Spiner coming in to play Dr. Soon's son. And I really liked how kind of nonchalantly they had Brent Spiner come out in this because he's not playing Data. If it was Data, it would have been like this big, huge moment, but no, he's just Soon, a character we've never seen before, and it's nice to have Brent Spiner back playing that character, and I enjoyed having him there. He gave such a, a good presence with uh, with the Soon character, Soon's son, but he wasn't played up as this like big moment, and I kind of liked that it wasn't sort of like a bonk bonk on the head, like, hey, look, we have Brent Spiner. Isn't that crazy? It was like giving appropriate weight to this character um, rather than giving a bigger weight to the actor 
which I thought was a, a nice subtle uh, touch there as well. And it also plays into the long history of Soon's family tree just getting crazier and crazier every storyline that he's involved in. Like, at this point, we know, like, Soon's family tree going back, like, several generations because of, like, Star Trek Enterprise, and now we get more of Soon's generations going forward. So it's just kind of funny that his family tree just keeps getting more elaborate as we go. So then we get this sort of, like, meeting of everyone on the cliffside, and they kind of, like, are pulling together all the different things that are going on. We learn that Soon's been... Uh, basically trying to continue his father's work, building all these synths, and we kind of getting them, like, all figuring out what the admonition means, and Gerardi kind of feeling like she was out of her mind. Also, one thing I quick forgot to mention while I was actually filming the review, I was a little bit pushed out in the episode where we learned that the Soji twin, and synthetic Soji, I guess as I'll call her, she could mind melt, and it's kind of yada yada by the, the Soon character that's like, oh yeah, she studied Vulcan culture so she's totally learned how to mind meld it was a bit weird to believe that she also had like telepathic powers like her biology made her telepathic in some way i mean they're kind of yada yada ying the mind meld ability in romulans earlier so it's kind of weird that the soji twin can do it in this episode as well i guess i could kind of buy that these synths are much more organic than data ever was i mean clearly soji bleeds and has mucus and things like that so these synths definitely are much more uh organic so they might be able to mind meld but it was just a it was a bit of a stretch for me and one that i uh i wish had been done another way like maybe they could like had a mind extractor or memory extractor thing from gerardi or like like she could download something. It was just kind of weird that she could mind meld. Anyways, it's not that big a deal. I can kind of get past it, but it kind of threw me out for a little bit in the middle of this episode. But I'm curious to hear what you think about it. And then we get this brilliant idea that I thought was I thought was a great twist, was that the admonition, the signal that the Romulans had been uh, reading, was actually made for synths, not organics. It wasn't a warning, but a promise for the synths that there is this alien species, this uh, alliance of synthetics, that if the synthetics of this universe... Uh, or this galaxy call out to them they will come in and just wreck crap they will wreck crap up i would use the other word wreck you know s up but i don't want to get demonetized but they'll just like wipe everything out it's like all right we, we're getting rid of you organics again very reaper mass effecty i talked about that in a previous video but i do think that that is actually a really brilliant twist it, it, again and it sets up this good ethical dilemma that's going to be carried out through the rest of the episode it's like do the synths call upon these more powerful synths to basically save their lives. It's either do we get wiped out by organics because they're fearful, or do we call out to the synths and wipe them out in return? Is it sort of an equal, you know, you know, we give back to them just as badly as they give to us thing, and sort of this like dual side of the same coin, is what I like about this is in kind of the same vein as Marvel's Black Panther did, it gives the appropriate understanding to synths. Because the problem with doing a storyline like this, where it's like, oh, do we give back to them the way they gave to us? It, it runs the risk of placing the oppressed group on equal footing, on equal ground, saying, yeah, you're just as bad as the oppressors. Which, which was the problem with the episode of the original series, uh, Let This Be Your Final Battlefield, where kind of both aliens in that episode, the half-black, half-white races, were kind of seen, even though one was clearly the oppressor and the other was the oppressed, it was kind of saying like, oh, they're both kind of mad and crazy, and it's both kind of their fault. But here, we do get a discussion of the fact that the way the synths are mistreated and subjugated and oppressed and there's even a line later on uh where the soji clones S S serta i believe is her name the like synth more synthetic soji uh basically says like banning us was basically killing us in advance it, it's it's such a great discussion of like you know there is some just some justifiable anger and feelings. I'm not saying like, you know, mass murder and genocide is justifiable in any way, but the feeling of wanting to push back and fight back is entirely justifiable and entirely understandable, entirely right in a lot of ways. It's just, you know, where's the line drawn of how much violence you use in return? And that's always sort of the discussion in these, in these, you know, discussions. And, you know, as I'm not someone who is a person of color, so I can't really speak to this necessarily within people of color groups in America, but, you know, there was definitely like Martin Luther King versus Malcolm X being an example of this sort of dichotomy going on. 
uh, here. And I don't want to delve too much into that because it's not for me necessarily to dissect that. But I know Black Panther also discussed this too. We had Killmonger and we had T'Challa kind of having this same argument back and forth. And there is no definitive answer. It's just the extremes on both sides are both wrong. But there is middle ground, and where we meet in the middle is very much up in debate by our entire culture at the moment. And so I, I really liked that this episode kind of pulled that out. And pulled out, as we like later see throughout the episode, as and I'll just start to talk about it here because I'm already in it, uh, the Soji clone, she becomes just as manipulative as Narek. She's basically, she releases Narek later on to kill one of her fellow synths in order to rile up her fellow synths in order to want have them want to kill the organic life in the galaxy. And so saying, like, oh, I'll be benevolent and I'll save some of them, but ultimately... I will, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to try and kill them and I'm going to be manipulative to do it. And again, it's not to say she's just as bad as the Romulans, but she's using Romulan tactics and sort of that gray area that we all work in. I think it's just, again, I'm just really, really enjoying the ethical dilemma being set up here and the characters feeling that. And uh, let's discuss some of the character moments going on in the latter half of this episode. And I know I'm kind of jumping around here, so I apologize, but I think it's sort of better for the ebb and flow of the discussion at this point that we get a scene where Soji goes up to visit Narek because Narek gets captured. And we see Narek being this manipulative jerk. I was just literally, I literally said out loud, like, oh, you're being an asshole. Uh, when, uh, when he basically just says like, I love you and you know, I, you know, I'm, I came for you and we were wrong and you could tell he's lying, but then you can also tell that he's does have feelings for her. And it's just a really wonderfully, as much as I had problems with the Narek Soji relationship in prior episodes, I really love that the both actors are able to play the hurt and the manipulativeness and the anger. Like the Narek actor, he is just able to play up being manipulative, but also show that he has some caring and feeling, like true caring and feeling underneath all of it in a true Romulan fashion. There is some truth to the lie. And Soji kind of being able to read that and it kind of informing her dilemma later on where she, she feels that this this push and pull like she understands what Picard's telling her is they have this discussion with Picard where he sort of says you know it depends on if you're holding the knife whether you should be the one to to kill and that's sort of the dilemma that Soji has to deal with like we have this basically we can beacon that we can call out to just wipe out all organics but is it right to do that is it the right choice to to hurt a life to end life in response for them hurting you again just wonderfully beautifully playing out in ethical dilemma, like this large scale ethical dilemma, but on a small scale way within Soji's relationship with Picard, Soji's relationship with Narek, Soji's relationship with like the synth community. We're getting this really huge ethical dilemma brought down in a microcosmic way into Soji's character arc with all these different characters. And I think that that's, it's really brilliant. Honestly, this like the amount of like, making these huge ethical decisions personal on a one-to-one -one scale, like showing like these big ideas of oppression and uh, abuse and manipulation and subjugation can be played out when we talk about big, huge groups and uh, oppressed classes in the United States, but also can happen in a, an abusive relationship. And there's similar ties and themes and threads in those. And I, I think it's just really beautifully played with, by Soji and Picard uh, being the wonderful teacher that he is, like while we've seen him be flawed, he knows what the right thing to do is. And his the hardest thing for him is getting people to believe him. And I like that, you know, this character that we know from the next generation who was always able to make this grand speech and save the day and make people convinced that he is right just at the end here fails when he stands up in front of the group of sins he he makes that picard speech and ultimately we understand that no he can't persuade them because he's failed before sometimes the best of intentions no matter how hard you fight for them sometimes don't beat the system no matter how hard you fight for them sometimes you you don't win and picard's saying you know i will fight for you i will be your advocate and i will make the federation listen to me that's you know, it's a great promise, and it's something that I know Picard would say. It's something we've seen him say in The Next Generation, but ultimately we know that, you know, those promises are almost just as good as the the will of the the government behind them to back it up. 
and the synths, while we know the Federation ultimately does try to be better than the Romulan government, it does try to uphold these ideals, it does fail. And the synths have no real reason to believe that Picard will be victorious in the end, and understandably so. So what choice do they have but to pull this trigger? And, you know, Picard is right. On every level, he is morally right. But the situation that you're placed into may not allow you to make the right decision. And so I, I, I just, it's this really complicated dilemma that I just, it, this episode just really just shows all these ma multifaceted layers of the situation here that I just, uh, I really love it. I, I really think that as much as I have problems with how it, you know, kind of quickly came together last episode, just, just a brilliant ethical dilemma played out in macrocosm and microcosm and really showing the multifaceted sides of all of it here. All right, I've been talking a lot about this, and I think there's only just a few other things that I kind of wanted to mention here. Uh, there's some really wonderful character scenes, mostly, I think, between Gerardi and Rios get a really beautiful scene. I really think I'm I'm starting to invest more in this, like, Gerardi-Rios situation, uh, this relationship between the two of them that I hope develops into season two, where we kind of get Gerardi kind of dealing with the guilt of her choice with Maddox and Rios kind of helping her through that and still, like, having the thing for her and finding her unforgettable. I, I, I think that the while they... They kind of jumped into the bedroom really quickly in one episode, which was understandable given Gerardi's emotional situation at the point. I'm really liking that this relationship between Rios and Gerardi is like slowly building here. I also liked Soon calling her out and saying, you ended a life and so now it's your duty to try and make it up to Maddox and try to do the right thing. We also get uh, an interesting idea of mind transfers uh, being built there with Soon. So who, we know this, you know, it's a Chekhov's mind transfer, Chekhov's synth. So someone's getting mind transferred next episode. Gerardi says she wants to do it to try and save Soon, but maybe Picard will be put in that body. What a weird treat it would be if that body turns out to look like Brent Spiner, Data, and then Picard gets put in Data's body and then we have Brent Spiner having to play Picard for a minute. That would actually be hysterical, uh, but I, I don't know if that's the way they'll go, but I, my brain kind of goes there and thinks it, think it would be a lot of fun. There's many possibilities. Maybe we get Data back in some way, shape, or form. And then the only other scene that I think I want to mention here is the Raffi and Picard scene. What a beautiful scene between the two of them with Raffi saying, I love you and thank you for everything you've done. Uh, I felt a little bit a little bit too quickly. I mean, we didn't really see Raffi healing from her uh, addiction at any point. Like, clearly she's, like, be be becoming more invested. I think the point they're trying to say is by becoming more invested in this uh, plot and being able to, like, resolve this sort of uh, idea of, like, this big conspiracy that she's been holding on to her whole life that she's able to finally reconcile and kind of deal with her addiction. Uh, but, it, uh, you know, I wish we had kind of gotten a little more of Picard being an active player in that development uh, in the last episode or two to really make that ring a little bit truer. But as it is, both actors play it a, a really, really beautifully here that, uh, that they say I love you to each other. And it's really nice. You don't... I, 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 I've said this before, but you don't often get to see male-female platonic loving relationships. Seeing Picard say, I love you, to someone, and not meaning it in a romantic sense, but meaning in just a genuinely platonic sense. And we, we don't get that as often as we should on, on TV and movies. And I'm just really, really happy to see a genuine platonic friendship between people of two genders and ages. Uh, just really, really nice. Also, I'm looking at my notes right now. I forgot to mention Rafi gets an ocarina and just says, use your imagination. So uh, check off ocarina as well. And then the only other thing that I will mention here is obviously Picard calls Starfleet. So I'm sure we're going to get in the final episode, a bunch of Starfleet ships showing up and possibly saving the day at the last second with maybe Riker being in command because we had, again, we had uh, Chekhov's Riker's uh, being called back into the fleet. There's a lot of Chekhov's guns that need to go off in the season finale is basically what I'm saying. Realizing also Chekhov is a Star Trek reference. So all the references. So I think that that's set up for that, that we're going to see a bunch of Starfleet ships show up in the finale. And then we get the final shot with a huge Romulan fleet on its way and uh, clearly will be a big, huge battle a la Star Trek Discovery Season 2. All right, that's my thoughts for this episode of Star Trek Picard. Like I said, overall, I think it's really beautiful and wonderful, and my only frustration is not from anything being bad, but just things that were actually really, really intelligently done, but just didn't get used to their full potential, which is just uh, mildly frustrating on my part. But overall, in general, I think that this episode just 
in the best Star Trek way possible, finally ties together all the different pieces and all the different character developments that we've seen throughout the season to really lay down in front of us, here's the ethical dilemma. Here's how it plays into a huge macrocosmic look at the world and the Federation and, you know, oppressed classes and sort of like societal social commentary, but then also plays it on these small scale ways within the characters. And I think that that tying together in this episode just is absolutely exquisite. But enough from me. I'd love to hear what you think about this episode down in the comments below. I'd love to hear it all. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more reviews and discussions on Star Trek and other things. And don't forget to check out my Half-Life 2 video coming out tomorrow on Friday. I'm so proud of it and so excited to share it all with you. And if you want to help fund those types of videos and help me fund this channel, please consider giving to my Patreon. It honestly would mean the absolute world to me if you do to help, you know, do more videos and to help me maybe do this full time one day. It truly would mean a lot to me. But regardless of if you subscribe or watch my Half-Life 2 video or give to my Patreon, I'm just glad that you stopped by and enjoyed the discussion. I hope that you, as always, live long and prosper. And special thanks to my commander level and above Patreons, Eli Bergmoss, Stefan Schuthart, Boyd and Mary Beth Earl, Michael McGee, La Lindley, Wellington Marcus, Inar Sigurdsson, Marika Kwiechin, Munir Amlani, Mari Nekar, and Polly Mina.